Our sermon text this morning comes from Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Hear the word of the Lord. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance, how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent. Do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand, unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity to gather and to sing. Thank you that there is a gospel. Father, we acknowledge that you reign over not just some things, not just most things, but you reign above all things. You are a great king, and you are above all kings. You are a great lord, and you are above all lords. You are all wise, and even now praises ring out that you are holy, holy, holy. You are almighty. And yet we reject all of that goodness. And somehow feel that we know a better way. Or somehow feel that we should be in charge. And Father, transgressing and crossing the boundaries that you set, which were for our good, and going against your law, which was given for our good, you have every right to punish us rather than to preserve us. You have every right to deal with us as our sin deserves. But Father, we're grateful that in Romans 3 it says that you put forward Christ and that Christ went willingly to be the propitiation for our sins, meaning to to take your wrath upon himself in our place. So, Father, nothing we want to declare more clearly today than that Christ and Christ alone has been our substitute. And that you have done all of this by choice. You have chosen to rescue us. And then we are to respond by repenting and believing. Father, for each of us, may there be a clear day of regeneration where repentance and faith is shared with life and light. But may there never be a day after that that we stop repenting and believing. That your grace would help us to continue, for we are prone to wonder. And perhaps some of us this week have wondered. We've done some things that it would seem that we have walked away from the God who loves us and whom we say we love. But Father, thank you that each week as we come in here, we can be reminded that Christ did not take some of our sins to the cross, or most of our sins, but Christ has taken all of our sin to the cross. And so that we can quickly confess all that has already been covered. So Father, may we never stop singing the gospel. May we never stop praying the gospel. May we never stop proclaiming the gospel. Father, I pray that as we come to this text in Revelation, I confess this is a letter that I feel could often be written to me. And it has been. And it's been written to all of us who have ears to hear what the Spirit says. So, Father, help us to listen. Help us to be attentive. Help us to know an answer to the question of whether we love you or not. Each one of us in this room, do we love you? And is all that we do flowing from that love? 
I pray you would use your spirit and your word as always, not just to inform us, but to transform us or even more rightly to conform us to the image of your son. And we pray not just for ourselves, Father, we pray for our sister churches here in in Decula. We pray for our sister churches in Gwinnett. We pray for our sister churches in Georgia that the gospel would be clear and strong. That those who might get up to proclaim a word, but it's not from your word, Father, would you convict them and help them switch and give your people your word. For those who have prepared, Father, they need a fresh touch of your spirit to proclaim. Even now, would you fill me with your spirit in order to proclaim your word faithfully and rightly? Would you empower our listening and our responding? Would you meet with us now? Would you speak to us and over us and use this in our lives? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are walking through a series in Revelation and we've made it all the way to chapter 2. And uh, we will begin now a series of letters that were written to seven specific churches in Asia. And the first one is written to the church at Ephesus. But as we begin, I want you to imagine another day that is recorded in the Word. On this day, it was sometime after Christ's resurrection and the disciples were fishing. And Jesus makes breakfast for them on the side of the shore there and calls out and they realize pretty quick it's Jesus. Peter jumps out of the boat and swims ahead of everyone else because he's so eager to get there. But even when they all get there, none of them are saying anything. They know it's Jesus and it's one of these uh, incredible moments. But eventually Jesus is going to ask Peter a very important question. One of the last times Jesus and Peter had locked eyes, Peter had just denied Jesus for the third time while Jesus' trials were going on. The last time they had looked in each other's eyes. And after that, Peter went out and wept bitterly, ashamed at what he'd done. On this day, on the side of the shore, they lock eyes again. And fortunately, though, Peter had messed up in incredible ways. Jesus wasn't done with Peter, amen? How many of you are grateful that when you mess up, Jesus isn't done with you? And then part of the reconciliation process and restoration process, Jesus looks Peter in the eyes and he asks him this question, Peter, do you love me? To which Peter responds, yes, Lord, you you, you know that I do. He says, feed my sheep. And he asks it again, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. Tend my sheep. And then a third time, looking him in those eyes, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. To which he says, feed my sheep. Church, if if Jesus were here in this room, which he is, but if he were here physically and were looking you in the eyes today and he asked you the simple question, do you love me? Would you have an answer? What would that answer be? Because that answer is the most important question in all the world. For Peter, there was certainly something that would cause Jesus to doubt that love. Those three denials would cause him to doubt. I wonder in our life and in our lives, is there anything that would cause Jesus to doubt our love for him? Would the question be prompted because as he watches how we carry our life out, during the week, that it, it causes him to wonder if we love him. And it's interesting because it's not just for those in, in whom denial is present. The question has to be asked in times for even those in which dedication is present. People who are saying and doing the right things can do those without loving him. I counseled a man whom I love, uh, his wife after some difficult things, loss of a child, and after over 30 years of marriage, came to him and said, I do not love you, and I have never loved you. And she left him. He rightly was absolutely devastated and crushed. We have said in our series 
already one day you and I will stand before the resurrected Christ. Will there be any in this room who on that day have to say, I don't love you, Jesus, and I never have? Because that will be a tragedy. It will be a tragedy if you have sat in this room year after year and you have gone on our mission trips and you've served in our outreaches and you have participated in our connect groups and you never loved our Christ. And it will all have been wasted for apart from him, we can do nothing. So you know what you do on a mission trip when you go not in his power, you do nothing. You know what happens, connect group leaders, when you teach a lesson but not in Christ and in his power? You do nothing. For apart from him, we can do nothing. And the question that we have to ask is, do we love him? How many will attend a worship service today, perhaps even lead in it from a platform, and they will sing the word and they will listen and take notes from the word. They will give in support of the word and attend a connect group for, to further study and apply the word all the while having zero affection for the Christ of the word. And that could be you today. You could have sung these songs and you do it because you know you're supposed to sing, but there's no affection driving that. There's no adoration driving that. A long time ago, a pastor who died at the age of 29, but who was faithful to his last breath, he said, you may read your Bible and pray over it till you die. You may wait on the preached word every Sunday. But if you're not brought to cleave to Jesus, to look to him, to believe in him, to cry out with inward adoration, my Lord and my God, how great is his goodness, how great is his beauty, then the outward observance of the ordinances is all vain to you. We were never reconciled for religion. We have always been reconciled for relationship with God. And I want to admit to you, I was thinking this week, I can remember outside our double wide trailer, we had a swing set and, a, and, and this brown metal carport. And I can remember, I, I, second or third grade, I can remember being on that swing set and I was just singing my little heart out to Jesus because I wanted to praise him. In that moment, I can remember just wanting to love on Jesus by singing to him. Now at 42, I wonder why sometimes those days seem so rare. I'm just wanting to sing to him. I want to admit to you today that sometimes I feel like all I do feels like responsibilities in Jesus rather than response to Jesus. Sometimes my work in the kingdom feels like things I'm supposed to do rather than privileges I get to do. I feel like obligations rather than opportunities is what I mean there. Christianity sometimes for me becomes for Jesus rather than with Jesus. You say, how's that happen? You have three degrees from a seminary. Yeah. It can happen to all of us, can't it? You can prepare a sermon and then never talk to Jesus the whole week long. You know that's possible, right? You can talk about Jesus to others and never talk to Jesus by yourself. You can nail every note in the choir about Jesus and not love Jesus. I know guys who have New Testament degrees who could parse every Greek verb in the New Testament and do not love Jesus. Which is crazy. Because the whole point, again, of reconciliation is relationship. But we tend to make the means the end. Forgiveness is not an end. Justification is not an end. Regeneration is not an end. Sanctification is not an end. They're all means to an end of enjoying and experiencing God. Being brought into right relationship with him. And I just wonder if, we are, if we've stopped. Maybe some of you, because life is rough. Maybe it hasn't turned out like you hoped it would. Or some circumstance right now is making it difficult for you to sing to Jesus. And you've just stopped. Or maybe some of you are singing, but, there, but there's no affection. There's no adoration. It's just cold and routine in your life. As a child and as a parent of children, one of the first ones we teach them is, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. 
Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus. What? Yes, Jesus. One more time. How do we know that? And that is not the song I question most in my life. I really don't question that song. Here's the one I question most. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how. Why? Why do you do it? Be. It says that there's a name I love to hear and I love to sing its worth, right? It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Is that name the sweetest name on earth to you, church? I don't doubt Jesus loves me. The one that I have to battle for is, oh, how I love Jesus. And the gospel is meant to fuel all of that. The gospel is, is meant to do it. And, and why does any of this matter? Why are you taking so long in your introduction? Mainly to bother the Monday afternoon guys. But why? Why are you doing this? Here's why I'm doing this. Because when asked what was most important, Jesus did not say, know the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He did not say, serve the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. When asked what was most important in all of life and in all of the law, and it was the same message from the Old Testament to the New Testament, he said, we are to what? Love the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Why would I belabor this? Because I want to know that each of us prioritize what Jesus prioritizes. That what he says should be primary really is primary. I hope you're not good Hebrew members who don't love Jesus. I hope you don't accurately teach classes and sacrificially live your life. And none of that is because you love Jesus. You're just really good members. You're really good academicians with the word. You're really good servants. But do you love Jesus? A couple of sentences that, that I would give you as a, a summary here. The gospel's meant to be the fuel that ignites faithful worship with our lives. The gospel is meant to be the fuel that ignites faithful worship with our lives. That's why you hear me saying we, we don't go past the gospel here. We want to go deeper into its implications in our lives. And faithful theology should fuel fervent doxology. Faithful theology is not an end in itself. Here's what I know about God. If I don't then take that knowledge and turn it to praise, I have again made a means an end. But knowing God rightly should lead to worshiping God passionately, right? That faithful theology should always lead to fervent doxology. And that what we're learning through our study impacts how we live a life of service. I hope that we're always learning and then living. That we should have both of these evident. And then one last summary statement is just, we're to keep on growing in theological accuracy. Doctrine matters. We're going to see that today in our text. That we are to keep growing in theological accuracy and sacrificial actions, but those are both to be fueled by Christological adoration. So we need accuracy theologically, and we need sacrificial action, but there should be something fueling that, and it is above all else. You just sang it. You just sang it. Above all else. And I just want to ask, church, is he? Is he in your heart today above all else? Is he your greatest treasure? If you were to drive by the parking lot at the church at Ephesus, by all outward appearances, they were very healthy. They had classes on systematic theology, apologetics. They had care ministry. They were going and serving. But this is the funny thing, right? Looks can be deceiving. And the Lord will not be deceived. 
You see, the Lord knew what was really going on, though everyone else would, would go to the church conference at Ephesus because it seemed they had it all together. The Lord knew they did not have it all together because he was in their midst. He knew the real story, and friends, he knows our real story. He knows what's true most of Hebron. And I just want to say that Jesus is not just interested in what you and I reveal. He's most certainly interested in what we're concealing, too. And so if we come to this text, I put it in a sentence form for you, a passage in a sentence in your notes. And if you don't have our notes, you can, through our app, you find the Hebrew Church app, you can download that. And we have a section in there for Sunday and sermon notes, and you can get those there. But toward the top of the page in our sermon notes, here's a summary of verses 2, 1 through 7 in, in Revelation. Persevering in right doctrine and passionate deeds are both necessary for a church to be healthy but never at the expense of devotion to and delight in Christ. Persevering in right doctrine and passionate deeds are both necessary for a church to be healthy, but never at the expense of devotion to and delight in Christ. Let me ask, has there ever been something that you quit doing? Anyone? Uh, I quit running. So, and it was immediate when I hurt my knee, but it's been a a gradual staying away since then, right? But how many of you, something you quit, it wasn't just a strong immediate, you just gradually stopped doing it over time. What what we see in our text here is somehow it is possible for a church to over time gradually stop loving Jesus. And I want you to know Jesus, you'll hear me say later, but he is not interested in he and us having mutual agreement, but mutual affection. That's what he's interested in. And so this church, this letter scares me because it could be us and it could be me any given week. Here's what we see in, in Revelation chapter two. We see that Jesus communicates with his church. He, he has these letters written. He says in verse one, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write. And this is how he identifies himself, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. He communicates with us because he cares for us and he's still constructing us. He's still building his church. And so he's sending this communication and there's a pattern of these letters and I've put those in your notes. If you were to identify these seven letters, these are gonna be in each of these letters. There's uh, to the angel, to, to whichever church it's addressed, There's then an identifying aspect of Jesus, which are all going to come from the text that we saw last week from Revelation 1. There'll be some aspect of himself that he reveals and that he then reminds this church about that. And then he'll say, here's what I know about you. I know what's going on. And then here's the the criticism. This is what I have against you. And then he says, the one who hears, what are you going to do then in light of this? And if you overcome, here's the promise of what you get to participate in. So all seven of these letters have the same elements, and that's what those are. And in case you haven't studied the seven churches, I put a summary there. The little red Life Application Bible Commentary had a good summary that I thought would be helpful for us. You have the loveless church, the persecuted church, the lenient church, the compromising church, the lifeless church, the obedient church, and the lukewarm church. That's what we'll, we'll see as we, we study these next seven churches. And only two of these are really going to have this overwhelming commendation and encouragement. Five of them are going to have criticism, and that should be hopeful for us, that even when he has to correct us, he's not leaving us. He's still working to construct us. And so this letter opens, and it's to the church at Ephesus, and he identifies himself as uh, the words of him who holds the seven stars as right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. In case you haven't, uh, it's been a minute since you studied the book of Ephesus or Ephesians or, or about the church at Ephesus. We actually know more about the Ephesus than we do many of the New Testament churches. We know how it began in Acts 19 that Paul went there and helped start, a, start this church and he stayed there with them for two to three years. And we know that the second point of that is when he writes the letter to them. And it's one of the heaviest letters of doctrine and theology. But then how it plays out, he hits that therefore in Ephesians chapter 4 to say, because these things are all true of you in Jesus, this is what should be true now that you do in Jesus, right? And 4, 5, and 6. But we know that something began to change in Ephesus because as he writes the letters to Timothy, he's encouraging Timothy to correct some things, to, to deal with some things that the church 
at Ephesus because a church that was once very healthy and vibrant has begun to decline, has begun to let some things creep in a little bit. And then this is the last picture that we have of the church at Ephesus. Here are the things that you're doing well, but here, here's the thing that you really are missing the most. And he, he corrects them about it. I had the privilege a couple of years ago when my father and mother-in-law were stationed in uh, Hawaii for the first three years of their marriage, a military service. Not everyone gets punished in that way, but some do. And uh, they helped plant a church there. And it was neat. We went back for the 35th anniversary of that church. And it was neat to see what God had done in those 35 years and how other churches had been planted through them. And, and this has been about 30 years. The Ephesus is about 30 years since Paul had been there. And, and here's the checkup on them and, and what had, had gone well. He knows them because he holds the seven stars in his right hand and he's present among them. He walks among the seven lampstands. Has it ever occurred to you that you will never inform God of anything? Right? So no one had to write and say, God, here's what's going on at Ephesus. He's like, I know very well. I'm walking among those lampstands. I'm holding the stars in my hand. And so he's never shocked or surprised or caught off guard. And what I put in your notes, he's neither ignorant of nor ignoring the things that displease him in his church. The Old Testament book of Habakkuk, Habakkuk says, God, don't you see these things in Israel right now? Here are the things that, he, that Habakkuk had an issue with in Israel. Violence, iniquity, wrong, destruction, strife, contention. The law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. The wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. This is all in Israel. This is among God's people, right? And God responds to Habakkuk and says, I know, I know all that's going on. That's why I'm raising up the Chaldeans to come against you guys. And that's when Habakkuk's like, well, that's not what I was hoping for. That's not the plan I was envisioning here. And he says, I know, but I'm the one that makes the plan. Habakkuk didn't inform God of a single thing that was happening among his people. And no one has to because Jesus is here. He's in the midst. And even with us today, he walks among his lampstands. So what he then shifts to do is he commends some things about them. And what I've given you as sort of a summary statement is he encourages us in our diligence. Here's what he says in verse two. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. I know you're enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake and have not grown weary. He even says in verse six, yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate, which if Jesus says he hates somebody, we should pay attention to that today, right? But he says, here are the things that I want to affirm. You are serving. You are, you are doing these deeds. He says, I know your works, your toil. The, the toil there means laboring to the point of exhaustion. They were doing VBC every week, you know? They were laboring. They were serving. They may have been loveless, but they were not lazy. 1 Corinthians 15 says that they were to be steadfast, immovable, abounding in the work of the Lord. That's what we're to be. That's what Ephesus was. Ephesus was steadfast, immovable, abounding in this work. And I hope we continue to be known as not a church that just teaches doctrine, but we're doing things. We are serving. We're taking action in our community and that we are living what we are learning. But hold your place in Revelation for one moment and turn to 1 Corinthians 13. Turn to 1 Corinthians 13. Tara's grandfather memorized this chapter and said it at our wedding in his Mississippi drawl from memory. So I think about Papa every time I come to 1 Corinthians 13. I just want us to consider the first three verses. Here's what Paul writes. He says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. So what Paul is saying is he's taking these different gifts and he's ramping them up to their, their full extent. If I could speak in the tongues of all men, and I could even speak in the tongue of angels, but I don't love, I'm just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had incredible prophetic powers or I had faith to move that mountain that Jesus said, complete faith, but, but I'm missing love, then I'm nothing. Now watch this. 
if I give away all I have. How many of you would say that's pretty sacrificial to give away all that you have? Now watch, he, he adds to that. And if I deliver up my body to be burned. So if you give away all you have, the only thing you have left is your life. And he says, if I give away all that I have and I even give up my body to be a martyr. But he says, but have not love, I gain nothing. Do you know why Paul had to write that in 1 Corinthians? It's for the same reason that, that Jesus had John write this in Revelation. We can do a lot of sacrificial things and not love Jesus or even those for whom we're sacrificing. And he's calling us on it. You may give your life as a martyr, but if you didn't love me, you gain nothing. That it is possible somehow to give away all and not have love that's fueling that. So what Jesus rightly confirms for them back in Revelation 2 is, look, you are sacrificing. You are toiling. You are not lazy. You are working hard. I, I see that. And then he says, you keep doing this. There's perseverance. There's durability. You are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake. So they're even suffering for the name of Jesus. It's not just for the name of Ephesus, that they are suffering for the name of Jesus, and they've not grown weary in doing that. That, that should be applauded. That should be be encouraged that you guys have experienced the suffering and you keep going at it. You're not compromising to get out from under it. You keep being faithful. You're serving and you're suffering and you're enduring these things and you keep doing it. And then he goes on to say that back in verse two, how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. He affirms not just their deeds and not just their diligence and not just their durability, but now he affirms their doctrine because you and I are not free to believe anything we want about God or anything else. We're bound by what he's revealed in his word. We are bound to believe this. And so right thinking though, is for the purpose of right feeling toward God, right? That we have logic, as another has said, for the purpose of love, not just logic itself, not just to figure out some things, that we need right doctrine. And I saw a young lady had, had tweeted something that said, uh, living the Bible will always be more important than studying the Bible. But uh, there's this false dichotomy. You have to study the Bible to know how to live the Bible, Right? But that didn't stop thousands from retweeting it. I was like, oh, help us, Jesus. Help us that we don't just like catchy Christian slogans. But that we have right truth and right doctrine so that, so that if someone shows up and they will say, hey, I'm a prophet, we will know they're not because we know the word. And we're not going to let them teach in our connect group. We're not going to let them teach from this platform. We're not going to put their teachings in front of our students or our children. So he says, I affirm that, that you know the right truth. And listen, if Paul has been your pastor and Timothy has been your pastor and John has been your pastor and you don't have right doctrine, you're in trouble. Man, they should know the word and they did. And so they recognize what was false. And he says, we I even love, I'm with you. Whoever these, as John said the other day in choir practice, whoever the Nickelodeons are, all right? Green slime them. That's what you do with them. Who were these guys? And, and you'll see them again in, in two letters when we get to the church of Pergamon. And all we really know is that they encouraged idolatry. They encouraged lust. They encouraged licentiousness. And, and they're, they're walking against the things of God. And if Ephesus said, not here, you're not. And that's the difference. Pergamum let them in. Ephesus did not. Ephesus knew enough to say, no. What I want you to see is that it's not truth or love. It's truth and love that are both needed here. And, and so they've tested. And so, as I've said before, doctrine is not an end in itself. Here's, here's the thing, though. I hope we're not the people who know the most about Jesus while knowing Jesus the least. It is possible to win Bible trivia and not love Jesus. Do not ever be the folks who know the most about him and love him the least, or know him the least. Eternal life is not knowing about Jesus. Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they know you and the one whom you've sent, your son.
that eternal life is not just knowing how to get there, it's knowing the one who grants it to us. So what he does is he confronts his church and he, he exposes our decline. He says, yet I have this against you. And who wants to hear Jesus say that? He says, I have this against you, that you've abandoned the love you had at first, that, that something has happened to, to cause you to, to no longer love. What, what fueled all this to start with, that's gone. Where is it? And so what's wrong is not the presence of deeds and doctrine. It's the absence of devotion and delight in the middle of those things that it should be devotion and delight that's fueling these other two areas. And I want you to see they didn't lose it, but they left it. One time I lost Alistair. We had gone to the dermatologist and, uh, and it took, we took our whole family, six, and we added my mom and sister, eight. And so Barnum and Bailey had come to town. We decided, I don't know why, to have eight appointments all together. I guess because it was in Memphis and it was a special doctor and getting them all in and we all had to weigh. We, they literally brought us all in at the same time, right? And, and I'm looking around, I'd held the door. My mom has her little walker, you know, and I'm holding the door, make sure they get in and, and the kids. And I'm looking everywhere and I cannot find Alistair. I cannot find him. And my sister begins to laugh in my face and she's like, you've lost it. I said, where, where is Alistair? She's just mocking me. Alistair was in my arm the whole time. <laughs> I was literally holding Alistair, spinning everywhere, Looking for Alistair. I'd lost it, all right. I'd lost my mind. That's what I'd lost. But what, what Jesus says here is they didn't lose their first love. They left it. They didn't just lose it. They abandoned it. They let go of it. They, they departed from it. And, and Jesus says, again, I don't want us to just be partners here. Some of us have maybe marriages where it's just a partnership. There's no longer mutual affection. That probably didn't start week one. But over time, we stopped doing whatever it is we used to do that would pursue each other, that would cause that passion to be kindled. And Jesus, again, isn't interested in just mutual agreement, but mutual affection. They were still doing all of the right things. Jesus doesn't say, stop serving. He doesn't say, stop teaching systematic theology. Somewhere they were still doing the, the right things, but they'd stopped doing them for the right reason. The right motivation had gotten lost. They'd, they'd left it. They'd abandoned it. So I think one of the questions that we have to ask is, what causes our love to Jesus to grow cold? Because Jesus isn't interested in just what we do, but why we do these things. And I thought of, of several uh, things here. One, uh, we stop delighting in and enjoying God. That's always primary. And so we allow distance to creep in and, and God, instead of becoming father, now becomes just boss instead of beloved, right? That we allow this distance to creep in and we become comfortable with it. And we, and we don't do something to, to break our cold, desensitized heart. Sometimes when we have more emphasis on being right than the fact that we have been made righteous, then our hearts can become cold because we just won that theological argument. Being correct, being more important than being compassionate, perhaps. Walking with Jesus is exchanged for just working for Jesus. What happens is we stop talking to the one we're talking about. And it grows cold and distant. And we, we're like, how, how do we recover? Here's my question, though. Did no one realize it? Had this brand of discipleship been so handed down that no one could remember where it all started? Was there no one in the church at Ephesus to, to stand up and say, man, do y'all love him? I mean, we're exhausting ourselves. We are plumbing the depths with right doctrine. But do we love him? Is, was there no one? Fortunately for Ephesus, there, there, was, there was Jesus. And so what he does is he exhorts us to turn from our disobedience. And here's the counsel. He says, you need to remember, you need to repent, and you need to return. He says here in the text, 
Verse five, remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Man, if Jesus were to threaten to shut down our church, that should get our attention. What is it that would cause Jesus to want to close one of his churches? And so he says, remember, and this is written in the present imperative, keep remembering, keep remembering what you've lost. Remember what it was like. How many of you can remember when you first came to Jesus and no one had to encourage you to share it? You just shared with everybody about that. Do you remember that? How many of you sometimes long for those days again where you just couldn't help but share? You, you were excited. You couldn't help but pray. You, you wanted to study the word. And he says, remember Remember, and then repent, to take a decisive action. Uh, Dr. Aiken has said, labor is no substitute for love. Purity is no substitute for passion and deeds are no substitute for devotion. So do not pat yourself on the back for doing good things for the wrong reason. Jesus says, repent from this. Repent that you've left me. You left me, is what he says. Turn from that. And then start over, repeat, return to what you were doing at first. If not, I got one more R word for you. I'm going to remove the lampstand because I don't want to carry on this way. Jesus isn't interested in us just having a good partnership till we get to heaven. He wants a thriving relationship even now that, that we would thrive. And here's all I know. If you were to go find the church at Ephesus today, It's in rubble. That's another R word for you. So does it mean they didn't return? I don't know. Bible doesn't tell us. Bible tells us what they were supposed to do. All I can say to you is that in Ephesus today, there's rubble. And I'm not interested in that happening in Decula. So here's what Jesus says, in case we think, well, this is a good history lesson on the church at Ephesus. Here's what he says in verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So this isn't a letter just for Ephesus. It's for all of us to say, is there anything in this that's true in my life and in our lives collectively? Is there anything that we need to hear and respond to? And he says, to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So just as the pictures at the beginning of each letter point back to Revelation 1, the pictures at the end are going to point ahead to Revelation 21 and 22. The bottom line is those who hear and heed his words will be conquerors that he's allowing to persevere, bringing all the way through to participate in the tree of life. But I got to tell you, the point isn't the tree of life. The point is fellowship with Jesus. The point is being with him and dwelling with him and seeing him face to face. So what is it that we can do then to help ensure that we would be conquerors, that we would persevere, to keep affection strong? I just want you to look back to the previous chapter, Revelation 5. I'm sorry, Revelation 1 at the end of verse 5. At the end of verse 5, here's, here's what it says. To him who loves us, and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Why should we look back to that? And why should we do that? It's what I've told you. If we're going to love God passionately and others rightly, we must consider the cross constantly. We must consider the cross constantly. And the only way to do that is every day you look to Christ. You look to the cross. You consider this. If you can read that to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and you're not moved in any way, then what you do is you stop and you pray and you say, God, break my cold, desensitized heart to the most wonderful truth in the world. And then each day we consider something like 1 Peter 3.18, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. You stop having affection when you stop giving attention to the gospel. And it just becomes cold and religious. And Jesus says, I'm not interested in that. Remember what it was like when we used to walk in mutual affection. That's what I want you to come back to. That's what I want you to return to. The hymn writer has written this. My Jesus... I love thee, I know thou art mine. For thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. 
I love thee because thou first loved me and purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. I love thee for wearing the thorns on thy brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. Now, friends, we can break down this letter, intro, praise, commendation, criticism. But here's the main thing, and it's where we start. Is all the stuff that you're doing for Jesus because you love Jesus? Are you here just because you think it's the right thing to do? Are you here because it's just religious? What Jesus says matters most. Do you love me? Do you love me? He's standing before you today in the midst of this lampstand and he's looking you in the eyes and he's saying, I appreciate the toil. I appreciate those of you who are going to serve at the family camp out next weekend. I appreciate those of you who are going to go on a trip to Kenya and Uganda. I'm grateful for those of you who studied not just Saturday night to teach a Sunday lesson. Some of you started Friday night. But are you doing all of that because you love me? And if not, then what I want to say to you, church, is what the text says. Hear what he says. And return. Repent. Remember the sweetness of that walk and go back to it. I want to challenge us to respond in a couple ways then today. Mitchell and the crew will come. And beyond, do you love Jesus? Then the question would be, if if Jesus were writing a specific letter to Hebron, what else would he say here? We're going to get the benefit of all seven letters, but what else would he write? And I want to ask something else, very particular. If Jesus were writing the letter to your family, what would he praise and what would he correct? What would he encourage and what would he expose? What do our deeds look like? Are they gospel-fueled? Are we enduring, even bearing for his namesake? Are we compromising so that we don't have to suffer as much? How's our doctrine? Are we growing in truth? I pray that we are. But truth isn't an end in itself. J.I. Packer in his book, Knowing God, in the very intro, he says, why'd you buy this book? Did you buy this book to build yourself up and feel good about yourself because of what you're going to know about God? Because that's not an end or aim for this book. But that it would be that all we know results in praise to him and of him. Are our affections stirred? Not that we have to rev up, but because of considering the atonement, considering his sacrificial action, are our affections stirred? Maybe today you you need to begin that walk. Maybe today you need to return to that walk. Either way, our ministers will be here to pray with you. But let us not do this. Let us not just sing stuff. Let us not just go to places. Let us not just have faithful attendance and connect group. Let us love Jesus. Father, thank you for your word. I pray that you would help us because perhaps some of us in this room have, for whatever reason, allowed distance to creep in in our relationship with you. And today we need to remember and we need to always remember We need to remember primarily what it was like without you so that we will appreciate what it is like with you. We need to repent if if there are no affections, if what we're doing is merely just routine or religion. Jesus, thank you that you expose these things and it's a grace to us. Please help us not to elevate secondary and tertiary things to what you have said one thing is primary, to love you with all that we have and to love our neighbors ourselves, that that would follow right behind. So help us to not be really good at all the other stuff and miss the primary thing. When we look you in the eyes one day, and we all will in this room, and every person we know 
will. Most important question will be, did we love you? And all of the rest that we were doing it fueled because of that. So Father, if we have cold, desensitized hearts today, would you break them? If somewhere along the path, we became really good teachers, but not having to consult you about the passage. Somewhere along the way, we toiled to the point of exhaustion and giving out food or even going and praying in neighborhoods. But we didn't walk with you as we did those things. Show us and convict us. Grant mutual affection. If Hebron is to be known for something in our area, may it be we love Jesus. May each of us, when we walk out here today, not be able to just sing of how Jesus loves us, but may we never stop singing Oh, how we love Jesus. So anything that's between that today in our lives, help us to cast it aside, to repent, to remember, to return. It's in your name we pray. Amen.